I'm so excited to welcome you all to our final entrepreneurship issue forum of the year. Findings from the NORC Entrepreneurship Researcher Climate Survey, Sweet themes and next steps. This fall, we invited scholars who study entrepreneurship and innovation to share their experiences with us in a climate survey. We launched this effort in the hopes of gathering new information in a number of areas. For example, where is this research being undertaken across disciplines? What are the different methods, viewpoints, and perspectives that researchers across fields bring to this body of scholarship? How do researchers who hold differing racial, gendered, class, and other identities experience the climate within this field? How does this affect the scholarship we produce? How comfortable do scholars feel presenting novel methodologies, approaches, and ideologies at conferences, in the classroom, and in journal submissions? And how have the past couple years, including societal change and the global pandemic, impacted scholars' perspectives on and ability to conduct research? In doing this work, we've, grown, we've joined a growing number of academic fields and disciplines that have launched their own climate surveys. As scholars across academia in growing numbers over the past 10 years have become increasingly concerned with the experiences of those with underrepresented identities in higher education. For many fields, this has been an important first step that helps identify barriers and opportunities. We hope that by sharing these findings with you, Others who study entrepreneurship and innovation can build upon this work and advance efforts to make this field of study diverse and inclusive. I'd like to share just a little bit about how we've developed the survey along with our plans to share these results with you once they've been analyzed. We engage an advisory board of scholars who combined hold expertise in entrepreneurship, innovation, diversity and inclusion in higher education and climate survey work they also represent a range of the diverse fields that contribute to this area of scholarship. Today, we have several of these advisory board members here with us ready to join in conversation. We'll be working with our advisory board in early 2022 to publish a full report of the data and the themes that have emerged. Because of the nature of the questions we asked and our hope to reach scholars beyond our core fields, the survey was disseminated through an open link. We shared this through listservs, association newsletters, and our own communication channels with the hopes of reaching a broad range of scholars at all stages of their academic development who study entrepreneurship and innovation. By nature of the sampling method we undertook, our sample is quite small. Around 350 valid uh, responses comprise our findings. While our colleagues from NORC will share more about this methodology, I'll just share a few notes. One, we of course cannot consider these results representative of all scholars who study entrepreneurship and innovation. We do know, however, that many individuals vulnerably and thoughtfully share their experiences with us, and we're hopeful that this data will spark conversation. And two, the data we collected reflects and aligns with findings of other climate surveys, such as those surfaced in the most recent American Economic Association climate survey. Because of this, much of our conversation today and our analysis of these themes treats these issues and opportunities as broadly experienced. That is, these are structural questions facing all of higher education, rather than issues experienced solely by scholars of entrepreneurship and innovation. And a note before we begin, the entrepreneurship issue forums are a series that we host in order to bring research, practice, and policy together, and they focus on a specific topic about entrepreneurship. As a reminder, with every forum, the Kauffman Foundation takes no legislative or political position on the discussions. And with that, I'd like to turn to our colleagues, James Neumeister and Lauren Conti, who will share some emerging themes and findings from the survey data. After their presentation, we will then join a number of our survey advisory board members in a roundtable discussion of these themes and their implications. And as James and Lauren share their presentation, we welcome you to drop any questions you have in the Q&A box, um, and I'll surface those during our roundtable discussion. So with that, um, Jim, I can pass it off to you if you're ready. So uh, we want to thank uh, everyone, especially the folks at Kaufman, uh, for having us here today. It has really been a wonderful experience working with them, with the folks from the advisory board, uh, to put the survey together, uh, the study together, uh, and to begin to share some of the results from that, which I think, as Chai indicated, uh, may not be representative of everyone who studies entrepreneurship and of innovation, but definitely provides uh, 
an enormous snapshot into what's going on uh, and a snapshot, as she indicated, into not only what's happening within sort of this field or these fields of study, but more broadly, we think, uh, within sort of the entire higher education enterprise. So we are excited to share this. We hope that you all um, really enjoy this and get something out of this and know that there's obviously much more to be done, much more ways that the data um, can be analyzed and probably will be analyzed. So uh, I will do a brief, just very briefly introduce myself and Lauren. My name is uh, Jim Neumeister. I am a, a research scientist in the uh, Higher Education Analytics Center uh, at Newark at the University of Chicago. We're an independent nonprofit uh, research organization that now has a history that as we've been sending around lots of emails in, in, within our organization that's now 80 years old uh, and really proud to be here. Um, and uh, in a second, I'm going to turn it over to, to Lauren, and she's going to go over some of the methods and some of the demographics of what we learned, uh, and she can introduce herself as well. I'll come back in in a few moments to go over some of the middle parts, sort of parts three and four, and then Lauren will pick back up uh, at the end. But we're excited to share this information with you, and then excited, particularly excited, I think, to hear the insights of the advisory board members in terms of what they've been thinking uh, about uh, about what's come up. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Chaya. And again, I just wanna echo that this has just been such a wonderful experience to collaborate with the Coffin Foundation. Um, we're very excited today to share these results. Um, my name is Lauren Conti. I am also from Newark. I work in the Higher Education Analytics Center, as well as our space of K-12 research. Um, and I'm a survey specialist. Um, so I will get right into the methods. Um, as Chaya touched on earlier, um, survey development was a very collaborative effort um, between us at North, Kaufman personnel, and outside scholars and, and experts. Um, and this phase of survey development spanned several months. We obtained feedback from a six-person advisory panel um, of experts in entrepreneurship, higher education, and other areas. And this panel was representative of a range of academic disciplines and social identities. And then we further refined the survey through a series of cognitive interviews. Um, and what that means is that we had individuals taking the survey in front of us in real time. Um, and those people could give feedback on survey questions um, and you know, identify any potential gaps in the content um, and also just give feedback on the survey experience itself. And so we did five of these interviews um, with five scholars who study entrepreneurship from a variety of academic fields. And we are excited that they all provided very thoughtful, very detailed feedback on the survey instrument. And so data collection lasted about 12 weeks um, from the beginning of August to the end of October. And we administered the survey online via the survey platform Qualtrics. Um, we have recruited our respondents through a Kaufman listserv, um, so the Insights to Entrepreneurship email list, um, which has about 5,000 recipients. And we sent reminders out to those folks through this email list about twice per month. We sent additional recruitment messages um, to Kaufman grantees on newsletters and emails from cooperating organizations, as well as social media advertisements. And for the last few weeks of data collection, starting on October 11th, uh, we offered a $20 financial incentive to anyone who completed the survey. Um, after a data cleaning process, uh, we were left with a final data set that included 335 survey responses. Our data cleaning process included two main steps. The first was making sure we only included responses from our target population, so firstly, um, individuals who at some point um, in the past or in the future would be producing entrepreneurship and innovation scholarship, as well as our uh, target um, other populations, so professors, um, non-academic researchers and scholars, and grad students. And we also removed incomplete, duplicate, fraudulent, and non-responsive surveys. So that includes people who maybe clicked on the link but didn't actually fill out any questions or anyone who tried to complete the survey multiple times. For data analysis, we generated frequency tables and descriptives for all survey items. And we also did some initial qualitative coding for some of those open response questions. 
And for our analysis, we did um, uh, tests of statistical significance, so both chi-square tests and non-parametric tests. And we identified group differences based on gender, race, ethnicity, and academic employment status. So for gender, we looked at differences between women and men. Um, for race and ethnicity, we looked at differences between white people and people of color. And for academic and employment status, we looked at full professors, associate professors, assistant professors, non-tenure track academics, those outside of academia, and graduate students. So next I'll dive into the sample demographics. So basically who were our respondents? And so here you can see um, where our participants were born, as well as where they currently live. Um, and so this is something important um, to note as we move forward in our discussion. Um, but our sample definitely trended towards the north and towards the west. Um, and, you know, the global south was less represented in our sample. Um, so I mentioned before in talking about the analysis that we collapse the race ethnicity um, variable into two main categories. But in our initial asking of the question, we did account for other identities as well. Um, so you can see here that our sample was largely um, white, Caucasian, or Anglo folks. And then we had um, several other uh, racial or ethnic identities. Um, so we had 18% Asian or Asian American, 8% um, Black or African American. 5% uh, Hispanic or Latino, Latino, and Latinx. Um, I'm actually unable to see the bottom of the slide, um, but I believe that's 4% multiracial, 3% um, Middle Eastern um, identities. And then Jim, can you comment on that last 1%? The last 1% are those who identified as indigenous, either to uh, North America, the Americas, or to the Pacific Islands. Much appreciated, thank you. Um, and then in terms of gender identity, we had a predominantly a sample of those identifying as men, 39% um, women and 1% of folks identifying outside the gender binary. Um, and then for sexual identity, um, we had about 86% of our sample identifying as heterosexual and straight. 9% um, identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, or queer, and 5% of our sample um, identifying with other sexual identities. And then our age groups um, spanned a wide range. Um, so we had the smallest representation from folks under 30 and folks over 70. Um, and then the majority of folks coming in at those other age groups, so spanning from about the age of 30 to the age of 69. And lastly, in our demographics, we had asked about marital status and caregiving responsibilities. Um, so for marital status, um, we had the majority, so about three quarters of our sample reporting that they were married or partnered, and then about a quarter um, who were single, divorced, separated, or widowed. And in terms of caregiving responsibilities, we had about a 50-50 split. Um, so just over half reporting that yes, they did have caregiving responsibilities and those were distributed among the age groups um, you see below. Um, so children under five um, up to elderly um, to care for. Thanks. So the next set of slides is really going to give us a, a snapshot really into the professional setting and experiences and backgrounds of those producing uh, scholarship on entrepreneurship and innovation. So as Lauren indicated earlier, we um, sort of the, the group sort of divided up into six main categories. Uh, the full from full professors, those in sort of tenure track, tenured or tenure track positions, the full associate and assistant professors, those who worked in academia, but but off the tenure track, those who are researchers at out, outside of sort of universities or college settings, and then of course, graduate students. And the groups were relatively well distributed. Um, and you can see um, as we go through, we're going to note with uh, certain parts about where we did find certain significant differences. We're not necessarily going to go over all of those. Or we may not mention all of those in our discussion today. Uh, but for purposes of what we did uh, today uh, and for this presentation, we're only highlighting the differences that came up based on uh, gender differences between men and women. Uh, and racial differences between people of color and white people. 
Uh, we're not going to include, uh, we did do testing to see for variations across these six groups, but to try to get that summarized onto these slides was going to be very, very difficult to say the least. And so just know that there were a number of areas where obviously these differences did come up, some that, should, some that might be expected. For example, uh, it's not surprising that full professors uh, would have produced more publications than graduate students, um, but that there were different findings there. That'll be something that will have to be sort of go, gone over at a later date. We just didn't have the time and the space to address that here. Um, but you can see if nothing else on this slide that for uh, that amongst the full professors and those in the most senior um, positions uh, that men were overrepresented uh, and amongst graduate students we actually found that um, people of color were overrepresented compared to their um, their overall proportion within our sample. We then, of course, looked at sort of what their scholarly production status was and how much production they've actually done up to this point. And so you can see that uh, a good three quarters of the sample are currently producing uh, scholarship on entrepreneurship and innovation. Another 10% used to, um, but are not doing that currently. And then a smaller percent of 13% or so who plan to be um, producing scholarship shortly. Uh, many of those, but not all, were graduate students, but, uh, but certainly there were some that came up. You can also see that even across all of them, whether they had um, already produced or were planning on producing, that the overall amount of production was a median of four publications, scholarly publications, and a mean of 14. And you can see from that standard deviation of being quite high that the numbers were actually quite skewed. So they went obviously from zero to very, very high. Uh, we left the high numbers in there because just in looking at them, they seem to make sense. They tend to be coming from those who uh, indicated that they were the most senior people. So of course, there's no reason necessarily to, to disbelieve that. Um, and we did find some differences here. I think it's a, that it is important to, to point out in that uh, both uh, uh, white people were uh, overrepresented amongst those who are currently producing scholarship, more overrepresented compared to people of color, whereas people of color were more representative based on those who are planning on producing scholarship in the future. That again may come back to a little bit of the fact that uh, people of color were also overrepresented amongst graduate students. So there's probably some, some correlation there. We also saw that just in terms of the numbers of publications that both men and white people uh, indicated had significantly more uh, publications that they reported than those in the comparative groups, either women or people of color. As Chai indicated, and I think as all everyone who's on here knows, um, one of the difficulties in some ways or challenges amongst the study of entrepreneurship and, and innovation is the fact that it is a very dispersed field. People come at this um, from a lot of different disciplinary perspectives. Uh, these were perhaps not the, uh, we sort of collapsed some ca categories here, but it gives us a sense of sort of where a lot of the uh, scholarship or where the background is coming from. So some of the leading are those who are looking at management and sort of business administration sort of broadly. There's certainly a number, uh, almost a quarter that are, that are really specifically focused on entrepreneurship and innovation as a department or a field of study but then many others. So other uh, affiliate you know, economics and finance had a large number of people, but then others who come from other fields, social and behavioral sciences, such as sociology, anthropology, or psychology, education and entrepreneurship education was a lot. There are a good number of folks who approach this from a legal perspective, and then those from a public policy or public administration uh, area. Then there were other fields that, uh, a number of other fields that people filled out, um, urban planning, for example, accounting, other areas where uh, scholars were coming at and approaching the study uh, of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. So obviously quite a dispersed field. One of the reasons why it was a little bit difficult actually to um, sort of, you know, identify the sample because there's no sort of clear indication, unlike the sort of AEA or the AFA, which have a clear um, sort of delineation of these are people that identify as uh, economists or as financial uh, experts, don't quite have that on the entrepreneurship side and innovation side. There was also, uh, because of that, we asked a series of questions where we tried to distinguish between uh, how scholars who studied entrepreneurship and innovation, how they interacted with and their levels of interactions with folks in amongst other scholars of entrepreneurship and, and, and innovation,
but also what we called amongst their broader discipline. So for those individuals who did not identify that they were specific to and studying entrepreneurship and innovation as their sort of primary field or primary discipline uh, and identified one of those others. So it could have been business, it could have been finance, it could have been economics. We asked them to tell us a little bit about how, how much they're involved in that other field and then some of their experiences in that other field, in addition to, or I should say the broader field, in addition to their experiences just amongst other scholars of innovation and, and entrepreneurship. So this is the first slide that gives us some comparison about levels of engagement between sort of people specifically in entrepreneurship and, and, and innovation and those in broader fields. And what you can see here is that those, and that in general is that there's slightly more involvement uh, amongst those in their broader disciplines. So in economics, in finance, in business, um, in sociology, as it may be, than with, uh, than with folks specifically studying entrepreneurship and innovation. Not a huge, not a huge amount here, but a little bit. Um, and that was mostly seen, uh, well, that kind of shows it here. We also asked a series of questions to get a sense of not only who was producing scholarship, but then who were the folks sort of, um, who were experienced in sort of um, editing, advising, sort of the gate, for lack of a better term, the gatekeeping. Who are the editors, reviewers? Who is controlling what scholarship might be available, published, and, and out there? And so we asked a series of questions about individuals' involvement, both in terms of journals, with funding agencies, with, um, uh, and with uh, academic conferences as well. So in this slide, what we see is a number of the different positions. They're essentially arranged from most exclusive, those that the fewest individuals indicated uh, that they had experience doing to those that were um, most open or most people indicated or more people indicated that they had been involved in. So you can see sort of journal editor in chiefs and funding agency program officers um, were those uh, were the positions that folks had least experience with overall. Then there was sort of a middle group of editorial board members of um, funding and grant application reviewers and of conference planning committee membership, where it was a bit more balanced, you know, close to uh, close to or around a 50-50 or at least 60-40 split in terms of folks who had uh, engaged in those activities and those who had not. And then those with much broader, um, broader participation. So conference, you know, session organizers, conference reviewers and, and journal reviewers. And so those were certainly a, uh, a strong majority of individuals, you know, from two thirds to even four fifths of individuals indicating that they had engaged in those areas. And I think what we'll see here too is again, um, there does seem to be, it kind of gives us a bit of a hierarchy in terms of where are the areas that might be more open uh, or perceived as being more open or more access to individuals um, than others. And here, from here, it looks like certainly conference uh, planning and involvement uh, seems to be more open, at least in some ways, if you want to look at it, than, um, than journal editor positions or funding positions, grant positions. Um, and the other thing I think it is important to note here is that across a number of these different areas, uh, we did see significant gender and racial differences uh, that benefited men or that indicated that men were more likely to report uh, that they had engaged in these activities and white people engaged in these activities more often or at greater percentages than did uh, women uh, or people of color. Another question that we asked were individuals simply to list up to three different uh, professional organizations, conferences, professional development opportunities that they felt were most important to them in their development as a scholar of entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, we look through those and sort of coded them up because people sometimes put different sections or different areas, but kind of consolidated those. And the areas that had the most mentions, meaning at more than five mentions across the areas, are the ones listed on here. So you can see Academy of Management uh, was sort of by far uh, the most commonly indicated sort of professional affiliation, uh, followed by a group sort of in that uh, you know 20 to 40 range, Kaufman, the Babson Conference, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, U.S. Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship, uh, the Strategic Management Society, and then several uh, slightly smaller but still uh, repeatedly mentioned areas as well. And so that gives us a setting really of 
who answered, who was involved, uh, who the folks are, not only who responded from an academic perspective, but then also what are their experiences sort of within the field sort of experience level. Um, so we know that we have people at the very senior levels, those full professors, those emeritus professors, uh, those chaired professors, all the way down to graduate students, and then what they've done um, and what they've been involved with. So the next set of slides is really the heart in many ways of the, um, of the survey that we did. We asked a series of questions that addressed professional climate. Some of them were pretty general overall. Some of them were more specific about their views and perceptions, for example, of diversity um, or of different actions they might take. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time here, but just want to give some folks just know that this is sort of where we're going to spend a good amount of time. And we're also going to share at some points toward the end of this, towards the end of the section, we're going to spend some time looking at a few of the open-ended responses that individuals gain, because I know that one of the questions or a number of the questions that are going to kind of going to come up involve, do we know, you know, why or what's going on or what's contributing to sort of different perceptions of the climate? And those will give us a snapshot or at least provide some further richer detail in terms of explaining sort of where these are coming from. We'll also give some information about where there were statistical significant tests, which also provides some clues about perhaps what may be going on. So with that, we're gonna go ahead um, and, and launch in here. So the first set of questions that we asked really were um, the scholars' overall views about different measures, sort of the perceptions of the climate within two areas, both within and among the sort of second column over here to the right, amongst the scholars who just study um, entrepreneur, not just, but, but scholars who study entrepreneurship and, and innovation, regardless of their background, regardless of their, their sort of home discipline as it may be. But then we also wanted to get a sense of what those experiences were like sort of in a broader home discipline. So those who indicated that they were economists, those who indicated that they did business management, those who were sociologists. So we asked two sets of questions, and I think putting them next to one another helps us get some understanding or at least or some appreciation in terms of what's going on in terms of differences perhaps uh, that experiences uh, that people are having between in their home discipline and those amongst just other scholars of entrepreneurship. <clears throat> so the first slide we can see um, sort of the sort of five broad ones. There's, an, there's another set on the next uh, slide, but you can see here that the numbers are largely similar about 50% um, or so of individuals. Um, I, the other thing, I should, let me stop for a second. All of these questions were asked on a six point scale. So individuals can answer strongly disagree, disagree, somewhat disagree, or they could be somewhat agree, agree or strongly agree. So this is combining the top two choices on that six point scale. How many folks said that they agreed or strongly agreed? And so about 50% of the individuals that answered, answered that they were uh, either agreed or strongly agreed that uh, they felt welcome, that they were satisfied overall, uh, that they felt included both socially and intellectually, and that their work was valued. And those were pretty consistent uh, across all these different areas, and uh, both in broad field and amongst entrepreneurship scholars. Interestingly, we did see a number of areas where there were uh, differences on the basis of gender and sex, um, uh, or gender identity and racial identity, uh, within broad disciplines, but we didn't necessarily see those amongst other scholars of entrepreneurship and innovation. Another set, here's another set, and the top three are somewhat similar to the ones before, sort of um, broader scales, but these did not reach, you can see the first set of five received about 50% support in terms of the agree or strongly agree. These, this slide indicates sort of less support. So the first three in particular about others soliciting opinions about the research, about getting the mentoring that they needed and having a great deal of influence. We're not at the 50% level. Um, we're at the sort of 25 to 40% level. So, you know, one quarter to, to, you know, two out of six or so, two out of five or so uh, in here. And the numbers are, again, about the same between broader disciplines and among scholars of, of entrepreneurship and innovation. I think one of the areas of, of concern I think all of us would have are sort of the final two measures on uh, that are on the screen, individuals who agreed or strongly agreed that they had been discriminated against by either scholars within their broad discipline or among scholars of entrepreneurship or innovation, or that their ideas and opinions have been ignored. And while those numbers are the lowest amongst all of these at you know 10 to 16 percent, 
I think it's still, to me, it's still a troubling number. I don't think any of us would want to think that one out of 10 individuals uh, feels like they're being ignored or even perhaps worse that they've been discriminated against. And you can see from some of the tests of significance that we did um, that it was women and people of color in particular who fell, who fell into those categories at larger percentages, more significant percentages uh, than, did, um, than did white people or men. Uh, so again, an idea of what, what may be happening um, or some indication of what's happening within the fields. We also asked a set of questions about more to get more at that last question, so questions about how well their, um, their scholarship would be received um, and whether others would think that it was sort of warmly received. And again, sort of what the level is across the different areas. So we looked at academic conferences, just other scholars, journals, and funding agencies. Those are sort of the four that we continue to look at. And as we kind of indicated earlier, there was this idea that academic conferences appeared to be the most, uh, the area that where there was sort of most warmth and receipt, you know, over 50%, whereas the others, you know, other scholars, it's about 50-50, but in terms of academic journals and funding agencies, lower level still, and the lowest and sort of most exclusive being in that funding uh, area. So access to funding in particular seems an area where um, at least folks do not seem right now that their scholarship is going to get the, the support or funding that they may do, or might not be as warmly received, I guess that's the question that was asked. We asked a series of questions about individuals' perceptions of the need for additional diversity and inclusion in various aspects of scholarship concerning entrepreneurship and, and uh, innovation. And you can see here that in general, there was very strong support for additional diversity inclusion. And this included uh, particularly uh, those areas in terms of the context and populations that entrepreneurship scholars study. Um, so samples and you know, locations and things along those lines, but also amongst scholars themselves, that there could be greater diversity and inclusion. Uh, again, it also extended out then as well to funding agencies, academic conferences, and journal editorial positions, those sort of gatekeeper areas in terms of who is determining what is getting funded, what is getting uh, reported, what is getting support in terms of scholarship. So broad, uh, broad consensus, over two thirds support across the range on all of these areas all the way up to you know, four out of five in terms of greater diversity in the populations and contexts that entrepreneurship you know, scholars study. And again, important I think here that these were really strong numbers overall, but they're even more so uh, supported by women and by people of color. So if the numbers here are you know, 70 to 80%, what I recall looking is that uh, support amongst uh, women and people of color was into the 80s, um, and, uh, and the support for um, men and, and, and white people was in the 60 percentage range. So they you know, obviously met sort of in the middle of your summer, but that was broadly what it was. We also asked in this section a series of questions, and we're only gonna report on part of it here, about uh, individuals' reactions to difficult uh, negative situations, things along those lines. So in other words, you can, you can read the question on the screen. Over the past 10 years, have they ever personally engaged in any particular strategy to avoid negative consequences, unfair treatment, or hostile climates that could be related to an individual's actual or perceived identity? And so we also asked if they'd witnessed anyone else do this and some other questions, but we're just going to reporting about what individuals did, what the individuals indicated in the sample indicated that they had done. Um, and so we're going to divide this up really into three different areas. And so the first is different strategies that individuals may have taken during graduate school. And what we can see here is there's a number of them here from not essentially not talking or presenting ideas or discussions in a classroom setting, all the way down to sort of leaving an actual graduate school, but others in the way. And the one that obviously jumps out is the top one, right, is essentially not presenting a question, idea, or viewpoint in class. And that fully one out of four individuals, uh, in particular more women than men, had personally sort of refrained from bringing something up for fear that they might get some sort of negative consequence. And that is obviously something I think that we've been hearing about in higher ed overall, but it's certainly something that's surfacing here um, within this survey as well. 
not that these others that have lower numbers are any concerns. I mean, the fact that one out of 10 may have you know, skipped a class that they wanted to do or left, or one out, of, one out of 20 may have actually left a program. These are all concerning, but the fact that one out of four is not talking, I think we're gonna see this theme again too. Another area that we talked about was largely in professional settings. Uh, and again, some of these numbers are higher, but also compare, so similar. So not presenting a question idea or viewpoint in a work meeting or with work colleagues or with you know, academic people in your department or things along those lines. Instead of one out of four, we're now closer to one out of three there. And those who chose not to attend a social event after, after class or work or at a conference, again, three out of 10. So quite high numbers here in terms of what's going on. Once again, in those two areas, we find that women were more likely uh, to report doing that or taking that action um, or not taking that action as it may be uh, than men. Uh, again, there's even the numbers here are even a little bit stronger, sort of instead of 10%, it's about 20% of people who either didn't apply or accept a job or left a particular job because of issues going on or concerns about negative treatment. And, and about one out of 10 or nearly one out of 10 who took some time off uh, from a job. So again, we're hearing about folks wanting to not talk, not share information out of concerns of what's going on or not exposing themselves to that. And the final area that we looked at was in scholarly settings. Uh, and I, can, I think these numbers are perhaps in some ways, uh, as sort of an outside observer, the most worrisome in, in my mind, because we're seeing that one out of five, you know, to one out of four individuals are somehow uh, changing or not advancing some sort of particularly scholarly knowledge or idea or viewpoint or something that they'd be explored for fear of some sort of negative uh, consequence. And to me, that is obviously something that's going to impact what the overall trajectory of the field is, what we know about, what we can learn about, what others may build upon. And these are all worrisome to me. So the fact that all of these are 20% above is certainly worrisome to my end. And these, interestingly enough, there was not a difference. Um, we didn't find at least a difference in our sample between men and women or between people of color and white individuals. So again, not, not starting or continuing research, not seeking funding, changing the topic or content of what's going on, not contributing to discussions at an academic conference, um, changing conclusions uh, or methods or something in an academic or scholarly paper, or just not even attending a conference. So we're losing, it seems to me, some of the richness, potential richness and depth of the field just based on what people perceive as could be a risk uh, of what's going on. So with that, I think that's really those to me sort of beg the question of what's really going on, um, what is happening, uh, why, are, why are individuals taking these actions? What's happening? And so this uh, opens us up sort of so the, the main sort of open-ended question that we're gonna be talking about here today, which was a question that I asked about salient experiences. So after we went through all these questions about what's going on, we then asked them this question, please describe you know, salient experiences, either positive or negative, um, that affected sort of their perceptions of the climate uh, amongst entrepreneurship and innovation scholars. And we did a couple things here. So first of all, we did some initial coding uh, of what these responses. So to get a sense of you know, what we all had. So there are 134 comments total out of the 335. So about a third, a little more than a third of individuals uh, left a comment for us here. And of those, uh, most of them uh, generally tended to convey negative comments. There was a, a small portion, uh, I shouldn't say small, but there was a portion uh, one out of six or so that had positive, just included positive comments. Um, and then some that included negative, and then there were some that just sort of used as an opportunity to talk about in some ways, something else or what else might be going on. Um, one, one of the observations I'll share, and, it's, and, it, and it comes up here, it'll come up here in a second. Um, uh, this sort of provides a little bit more um, sort of, we then sort of subcoded once we sort of divided into positive and negative, we then did some further coding in terms of sort of what was the, you know, what was, what was positive or what was negative about it. The positive experiences, there weren't that many. They tended to be very um, short comments. They tended to be um, sort of very conclusory. There wasn't a whole lot of description. Uh, they just tended to be relatively short, but you can see sort of where they fell into. So a number of comments about the welcoming and supportive culture amongst entrepreneurship um, and innovation scholars, that it's not only welcoming towards people, but it's also open towards, uh, towards ideas. Um, 
they a number of folks commented about how entrepreneurship is is a more positive environment than in many other sort of related fields. Um, I don't recall exactly what the comparative ones were, but we saw that early on, right? So people could be management or economics or something along those lines. Um, some folks called out specific experiences with specific people, an advisor by name or something along those lines. And a couple of folks talked about just how the um, how it just was getting better, like the culture seemed to be getting better. So to give you a, a sense of what some of those were and sort of to get a sense of sort of how relatively brief those were, here's four comments that kind of illustrate some of those positive comments. So they're generally some of the most welcoming people I've met, that it's absolutely fresh and thought and forward looking. A PhD student indicated that they felt very good the way that other scholars approached them. And one even indicating that I'm only gonna work with folks uh, within the entrepreneurship field because of, because of how well so that's the general, um, that's the general sort of positive comments. There are also, as I said, some mixed. And so this kind of is a nice sort of transition to the next slide, sort of too longer. Um, and so the first one really talks about how their personal experience has been positive uh, in, in the field, but they also recognize that that is not necessarily the case for others. And in particular, they talk about um, individuals uh, who, because of their gender or potential what they talk about skin tone, race, or something along those lines, may not have had the same benefits or advantages uh, that they had. The second comment, I think, is an interesting one because it talks about how uh, there may have been a little bit of a fall off in some ways, right, in terms of uh, the inclusion level uh, among scholars of entrepreneurship and inclusion. But there are some areas that are doing a really great job at recruiting presenters and things along those lines. Uh, but yet there is still um, there still are some ongoing issues, and in this case, sort of the need for more diverse samples um, and things along those lines. When we looked at the negative experiences, and we coded those. We we coded uh, in sort of three different ways. So one was, and uh, there were a number of comments, as this indicates, that talks about sort of the, the the skewed research scheme. Either it was way too narrow, or that it was really skewed. That the research and scholarship tended to sort of go in one direction or another, or that's that was the concern of the individuals leaving it. And so you can see what some of those are. So many of those you can see just sort of it's just too narrow in general, or this specific field doesn't want to include me, but I feel like I'm part of it. Something along those lines, skewed towards certain dominant social groups or uh, economic groups or global. Um, you know, global positions, those sort of non-weird, those weird countries as a maybe Western educated, industrialized, so on, uh, within certain fields, within certain methods. There was also some, and we'll, we'll see this shortly, um, that said that there's been too much emphasis on diversity and inclusion, that that is now becoming a, a larger issue. Again, we've seen this debate going on in, in higher education at large. So a number of different areas. A few examples, uh, again, here to talk about sort of just in general, the narrowness of the field in one way or another. Um, again, focuses here on high growth firms um, as opposed to sort of Main Street or smaller businesses. The idea of it's hard to get funding because of mixed methods. It's just not seen as rigorous enough in some sort of way, or that's the concern that comes back. Uh, those in which there are concerns about sort of capitalistic approaches that entrepreneurship if you, if you sort of critique sort of the underlying capitalistic uh, notions of entrepreneurship, that that's not acceptable. Um, and then again, this issue that's come up several times about um, theories and samples really focused on certain dominant social groups, so white men and things along those lines, and that, that research on other groups may not be uh, as open or as, or as received quite as well. A number, another area that we looked at in terms of coding things was specific actions or behaviors that individuals were um, concerned about. And so you can, again, see those here, um, sort of main issues that came up, sort of silencing, dismissiveness, exclusion of individuals. Um, there were definitely concerns about sexist acts and sexual harassment, the concerns about racial acts or actions against, in some sort of way, sort of uh, those from the global south, um, bullying, hostility, and, and microaggressions, clickishness and elitism came up a number of times. Um, Again, just unfair critiques, whether in journal postings or in conferences. Again, several people talked about this idea of that, that wokeness has gone too far, that there's been too much emphasis on diversity, that that's now uh, creating some sort of issue, and then others. So you can see, see in here. We'll give you a few examples of these. We specifically did not include um, some of the more serious acts, just we just didn't, we didn't want to 
do anything to do that, but this gives you a flavor. Where, so it's not everything, but it's some of it, right? So the first one's about condescension and gatekeeping and dismissal, particularly of women, uh, and the fact that it's perceived as a male and white field. Uh, the second one talks about, it's interesting, comes from a, a graduate student, it seems pretty clear about, or someone who was re probably recently in graduate school, about how others did not necessarily recognize sort of systemic issues uh, in terms of privilege um, that, may, that may be at work. Um, again, and this idea of the clickiness of the area and that perhaps there's some openness um, to some forms of diversity, but only if folks would match some, something else in terms of some sort of elite education. That's sort of the underlying tone here to me. And then finally, uh, this idea, uh, again, that folks that are looking at Western and Northern markets and not sort of open to sort of um, researcher areas from the global South is again, another issue that came up. And again, as I indicated earlier, it wasn't sort of all in this direction. There were a number of individuals who um, spoke out about a concern that sort of diversity, equity, inclusion issues uh, had been taken too far. They spoke of the danger of wokeness. So the first one talks about the, um, the sort of forced you know, political correctness and virtue signaling, and that that's, um, that's what's causing some of the limitations. Um, again, you can see the second one, academic freedom of speech uh, are dying and, and intellectual curiosity are dying to wokeness. And then this bottom one sort of overt selection of individuals for visible identities uh, for equity topics. And, we're, and they're seeing that in RFPs, RFPs, you know, funding proposals, job ads, et cetera. Um, and I would say that there were a number of these comments. I would say it was interesting to read through just from someone who looked at all of the comments is that it, we would be going down and you would see one, you would see comments about individuals sort of bad experiences and then you'd see one that sort of says this and it was quite interesting to see the different and the rather, I would say sort of jarring, uh, you know, um, differences sort of between perceptions uh, from folks in the field in, in both ways. And then finally, there were some comments about sort of setting. So where do these negative experiences or negative things happen? Much of it was in the publication, sort of not enough things are getting published or conferences, those came up. And then in other areas as well, to give you a sense of sort of the employment and professional opportunities, rather than going through the publications and conferences that's been kind of hit on, this idea that people talked about sort of, you know, external letter writing, right? Promotion letters and things along those lines, um, you know, external reviews, uh, that there's a lot of politics involved in that. Um, this idea that perhaps there's a masculine norm within the area that might uh, be favoring uh, men in terms of whether it's center directors or consulting areas, things along those lines, or this idea of reciprocal hiring between a small set of schools, which we know we've seen and research has demonstrated out certainly within STEM fields and some of that, that you see a lot, you know, a disproportionate amount of the hiring comes from, you know, 10 schools or something or 10 programs or something along those lines. So with that, I am going to stop. I think I've been going on way too long and we'll just move on. I think Lauren's gonna go quickly through the mentors and the mentoring, but I wanted to make sure we did that, so. Thanks, Jim. Um, so we asked a series of questions that dug into mentorship. And so the majority of folks in our sample said that they did have a mentor. Um, we saw 63%, so almost two thirds of our sample saying that had their mentor is a scholar of entrepreneurship and innovation, and about one in five saying that their mentor is someone who is not a scholar of entrepreneurship or innovation. And then 15% of our sample um, did not have a mentor. And then we had about a 50-50 split um, for when we asked um, if members of our sample had mentored other scholars of entrepreneurship and innovation. And we did see a gender difference here. Um, so we saw that men on average in our sample um, mentored more scholars than women. Um, and so we dug a little bit more um, into characteristics of mentors and projets. Um, and you'll see here some characteristics of um, each of those groups. Uh, and I think for us, what we found most interesting here um, were those gender and racial differences. Um, specifically, you see the characteristics of sharing gender identity um, and sharing racial identity. Um, and so for both mentors and protégés, um, we saw that on average, um, uh, white people were more likely to share a racial or ethnic identity with their mentor or, or their protégé. And then in terms of gender identity, we saw that our sample members were more likely to have um, 
or our um, male sample members were more likely to have um, a mentor that shared their gender identity. Um, and then for those who had noted um, having a mentor or being a mentor, um, we asked if they had had any formal mentorship training. Um, and we saw interestingly that three quarters of our sample had not had any mentorship training. Um, for the quarter that spoke of their mentorship training, we um, asked further, you know, what topics um, did these trainings cover? Um, and we saw that 80% of the sample um, uh, had training that covered mentoring across identity or culture, and then 13% um, had training that covered mentoring online or virtually. And so our last section of the survey um, was looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and so the main question we asked in this section um, was about the time spent on scholarly activities since the pandemic started. Um, and we did see, interestingly, that the spread here was quite even. So we had about a third of individuals in our sample reporting that time spent on scholarly activities increased, about a third uh, indicating that time spent on scholarly activities stayed the same, and about a third um, indicating that time spent on scholarly activities um, decreased. And again, just wanted to point out that significant gender difference here. So we saw in our sample that men were more likely to report an increase in time spent on scholarly activities since the pandemic started. And then we looked at the impact on, of COVID-19 on specific scholarly projects. Um, and so we saw that half of our sample reported um, having to postpone or delay a project um, because of COVID. About a quarter reported um, beginning a new project, revising their methods or approach, changing the direction um, of their project or beginning a new project outside of entrepreneurship and innovation. And then uh, we had fewer instances of those ending an existing project before it was complete, um, changing overall scholarly agenda or direction, and then 7% having had a new project terminated before it even began. So I, we'll, we'll just conclude that that's really the, the vast majority. It's not quite everything that was in the survey, but it gives you an idea of the, the scope of the survey. Um, there's still more to be done, obviously, that can be explored, but that gives us a broad area. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chaya, and I think you're going to lead the discussion of what we've done. So, Thank you so much. Um, Jim and Lauren, I don't know how you packed that much information in in a short amount of time, but that was great, and I appreciate it. Um, now I'd love to transition to our roundtable discussion. Um, so Lauren and Jim are going to be joining us, but I'll take a moment to introduce everyone. Uh, we'll have Lauren Conti, survey specialist at NORC, Dr. Robert Fairley, professor of economics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Dr. Kimberly A. Griffin, professor and associate dean of graduate studies and faculty affairs at the College of Education and the University of Maryland, Josh Lerner, the Jacob H. Schiff Professor of Investment Banking and co-director of the National Bureau of Economic Research, Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at Harvard Business School. Dr. Maria Maniti, Professor and Bantle Chair of Entrepreneurship and Public Policy, Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University. And Dr. Jim Neumeister, Research Scientist, Higher Education Analytics Center at Newark University of Chicago. So with that, if every one of the panelists would mind turning their cameras on and joining me, um, I have some questions here that dig into the different subject areas of this data, but I wanna just start by saying, what was your first reaction to this finding? Um, did anything surprise you? Um, what didn't surprise you? What were your first thoughts when you went um, through these results? I'm going to jump in and start, if that's okay. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to uh, I would like to thank the Kaufman Foundation for uh, uh, doing this. I think uh, uh, this is an important conversation to have, and thank you for inviting me. So, and thank you for everybody who's listening. So, um, just a uh, um, few pretty general and quick uh, uh, comments, and then maybe, um, uh, first of all, I think we were all a little bit surprised by the fact that the response rate were so low. Um, my 
pretty long experience with the entrepreneurship field in general has been that it's a pretty involved crowd. And so the fact that we get a um, low response rate, it's somewhat um, um, expected, you know, when we ask people to take time, but at the same time, I was expecting a little bit more involvement and perhaps what we are capturing here is some fatigue. We live in a in strange times, uh, especially computer-wise <laughs> online. So maybe that's part of the, uh, the issue. The other thing that, again, it's not uh, surprising, but I think it's an important point for us to try to tease out, is the fact that uh, um, people gave answers that are consistent with a very broad set of concerns uh, some of those probably fall beyond the sort of scope of the uh, of the survey. So, um, uh, for example, there was a lot of mixing of concerns that were really about inclusion, uh, with concerns that are more broadly rooted in the academic system, the process, how it works, uh, both the way this is set up and how it's implemented. And so these are probably broader and older uh, concerns. It give us though a pretty nice a snapshot of the overall uh, climate. Uh, something that jumped out at me a little bit was that there is some, there seemed to be some degree of polarization in the, in the reactions we got, which reflect a broader uh, sort of a general trend. Um, I was a bit surprised, again, I'm just going sort of through the list of my reactions. I was a little bit surprised to see that there were relatively few concern, relatively few concern expressed about uh, diversities of the sort of intellectual perspectives and conversations. Uh, because of the academic setting, maybe I would have expected more of that. There were some concern about the methods and the acceptance of methods, but um, again, that was specific. The thing that jumped out at me um, in a more a, a somewhat painful uh, way are the results that uh, Jim and Lauren summarize in their slides 26 and 27, which are the ones, uh, basically the protective strategy implemented by people, that one in four people to the extent that our results are, we know that the results are limited, and but the one in four people decided uh, not to present a question or completely. To me, that's very troubling. Mm -hmm. um, it is also very troubling that that, that women seems to be a, a standard feature, of basically uh, a strong presence in all these measurements of discrimination. I. As a woman who has been in the profession for a long time, I was hoping we would get somewhat uh, um, better, uh, better results. And so I think that's one of the things that really needs uh, some scrutiny. The only other thing I can say is on the, on the uh, positive side is that from the, there seems to be some trend toward uh, a more diverse academy. That's what seems, which I think is what we are in general seeing um, in, uh, in our classrooms. And uh, so uh, one suggestion would see, I would like to see the results repeated in five years and let's see if, if something changes here. So this was the first attempt. Can we uh, check it again in five years, in 10, 10 years and see, and see what we're going? That's all I got. Thank you. If, if I could build a little bit on, on what Maria had to offer. Um, first, thank you for this opportunity um, and, and thank you for your challenging work trying to pull together voices that give us some level of insight um, about your field and, and the different challenges that folks are, are managing. You know, Maria, your first comment really stood, stood out to me. All of your comments stood out to me. They're so thoughtful, <laughs> but um, that there's this tension there around um, kind of individual level experiences and structure. Um, and that what I felt like I saw in the data was 
a relative comfort with talking about diversity as long as we're not talking about fundamental change. It, it's okay to see different people with different identities in our space as long as it doesn't require us to think differently, do our work differently. Like it's nice to have different people and, and diversity is fine. Um, but when we start having conversations about, um, I think a deeper level of inclusion, um, when we start talking about equity, when we start talking about justice, when we talk, start talking about, well, what knowledge is valid and what knowledge is not valid? Um, how do we realign structures and systems that we always assumed identified the best um, and start questioning that, that that's when people start getting a little bit more uncomfortable. So in the data, what I saw, you know, it, and I think like all of us, what caught my attention probably the most were the comments that were like, you know, stop all of this anti-racism nonsense. Um, you know, we're pushing too hard in the direction of wokeness. That's what the real problem is. To me, that often reflects um, a discomfort with changing what feels familiar, changing what feels comfortable, centering other folks in conversations. And I think that shows up in individual experiences, but also what knowledge is valuable, whether we're talking about mixed methods, um, attention to the global South, um, those ideas sound very close to me to, to notions of epistemic exclusion that um, Isis Settles um, from the University of Michigan, Nicole Buchanan from Michigan State University have been advancing that it's not only a challenge on people, it's a challenge on what folks study um, and what areas they focus on and what methods they use. And maybe those methods and those topics aren't as valuable um, and that those methods and those topics are often embraced by by our colleagues who have more marginalized and minoritized identities in the academy. So that that was ultimately what I saw coming up in the data that there's this tension um, taking place, um, moving beyond this conversation around diversity, which was kind of our first big step to how do we make you know the academy more generally, but particularly this field more equitable and more just. I just want to quickly uplift that we have a really thoughtful comment in the Q&A section that relates to your first point, Kimberly, I think. Eduardo says, an important point to make in funding is that study sections slash panels are becoming more diverse. The bodies, i.e. councils, that make the decisions are not. So I think getting to your point about representation, but an unwillingness to shift the underlying structure. I'd like to, you know, kind of add something about the discrimination part, I thought was quite alarming, right? And what I noticed looking at it is that it's higher in the entrepreneurship field, which is Maria made a good point. I mean, entrepreneurship is a smaller area than say broader economics or broader sociology or broader finance. And, you know, some fields, especially like economics and finance are much less diverse overall, right? They're, they're the fields that you see fewer, you know, um, people of color in, women in, right? Not to the extremes that you might see in engineering, but certainly much less diverse than other social sciences or certainly than the humanities. And it's interesting that in within entrepreneurship, I think it was 30% of respondents said that they strongly agree that they felt discrimination at some point in their career. And then there were also high rates of people saying that they I think moderately agree and you know that we're not in the kind of never seen discrimination category or, or at least infrequently saw discrimination. That's very alarming. Um, and of course, when you add to that, you know, that there were a number of people that reported that they faced sexual harassment and that they have faced other really uncomfortable situations or microaggressions or things like that. I think that, you know, this is really interesting. I think that the field of entrepreneurship and just kind of more generally the other fields that are broader really need to take these things seriously and, and try to make a difference here. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's just gone on too long, right? We need to kind of make those changes. Anyway, that was kind of my like initial reaction. Um, those were the things that really stuck out with me. There were also a lot of really other interesting findings um, that both Kimberly and Maria, you know, kind of talked through and mentioned and that, um, you know, we can talk about more. I guess I'm last, so um, I don't at the risk of repeating what's been said before. Um, first of all, thanks and terrific job. And um, you know, I, I do want to underline that point around uh, around which I think Maria originally raised about the importance of some sort of baseline, right? That it is it would help in terms of the interpretation, in as much as NRC has done other climate surveys and so forth. 
to give a bit of a sense of how entrepreneurship stacks up against other, other fields. And obviously, if indeed entrepreneurship is less bad, that's not an excuse for us to just pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, you know, you know, 30% of people feeling, you know, strongly negative is okay because other fields are worse, but at least getting some degree of calibration as to where we stand is, I think would be helpful. And, and clearly, you know, I don't know to what extent we can do this given the relative small number of respondents and the, um, and the um, um, uh, just need to preserve confidentiality. But, you know, in some sense, entrepreneurship is a bit of a mixed bag, right? In the sense that, you know, we know that there is, you know, a set of people for whom, you know, uh, Academy of Management is absolutely the central point and other people who have probably never been to Academy of Management. And in a way, you know, it may be too hard to do, but if one could get a sense of, how, this, how these issues vary across uh, subfields and might be something that would be helpful as well, just in terms of thinking about responses. But to me, at least, I mean, there, there are probably 20 action items that come out of it, this, but you know, a couple of things that sort of really jump out is just trying to do more to figure out how to make conferences and events, um, you know, more inclusive and welcoming, particularly to younger people, minorities, uh, you know, and you know, underrepresented people more generally. That, in a way, I think so often when we plan events, you know, we say let's put together a great program, let's have some great discussions, you know, let's make sure we have a diversity of participants on the podium, but really thinking about the experience of people who are there and how one can make sure that people feel integrated and engaged in the experience and really get as much out of it rather than getting just simply lost in the crowd as a, a younger person is, is not saying that I think we've always put as much emphasis on as we, uh, as we should. And you know, whether that means you know, doing in some sense, some pre-meetings, you know, creating some sort of mentorships, breakouts, and stuff like that in the context of the meeting. But in a way, just, you know, not, you know, figuring out a way to make sure that people, you know, in addition to the, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the, the most explicit stuff, which is obviously creating an environment where, you know, there's zero tolerance for, you know, bad behavior like sexual harassment. But beyond that, they're saying, how do we really figure out a way to get, uh, you know, people who may be a little bit at the periphery due to age, demographics, and so forth, really to feel involved. And even if they're not in the program, that they're really getting out, involved in it, you know, getting their voices heard and really getting the kind of feedback that they need. So that was at least one thought that I had. I think you raised a good question that I'm wondering, Jim and Lauren, if you can touch on. Um, I know that NORC, not necessarily you, have led on other climate surveys. Um, it, can you share just a little bit about how this looks in relation to work that other disciplines have done? I, you know, I haven't looked at those for a while. I should I should have because you know honestly I was thinking like there's someone's going to ask these someone's going to ask this question and I just unfortunately I didn't I haven't looked at those recently. What I do know, however, is that so the ones that I know that we've been involved with are the American Economic Association, American Finance Association, Canadian Economic Association. So fields that aren't that far or certainly overlap with entrepreneurship. The thing that I know is that sort of these divides, as it may be, um, that I, I don't recall if it was Rob or who brought up, but sort of this real polarization of ideas where there's some folks who are like, we are not nearly doing enough in terms of being diverse or inclusion. And those who uh, are taking a more, you know, what some folks are called sort of a cultural traditionalist view, right? Like, you know, you're pushing too far. There's too much focus on equity uh, and inclusion or wokeness or however you want to term it. That has been present on all of the surveys that we've done. Um, and it's certainly present um, in the comments um, and I don't think that's surprising. I mean, we even see that in lots of commentary about higher education, whether that's in Chronicle of Higher Education or on the editorial pages of, you know, the Washington Post and New York Times or whatever it may be. Um, so that sort of divide and that sort of polarization um, is certainly there. 
I think the piece to me um, that I don't know that in some ways I'd almost want to ask most importantly are those sort of those sort of protection strategy questions in terms of because to me those are sort of in some ways the most telling like who like how many people are not saying something and who is it that's not saying something because to me that really goes to the heart of what the academic experience really is what scholarly exchange is supposed to be about it's supposed to be about openness it's supposed to be about sharing it's supposed to be about people presenting ideas and really engaging with those ideas and if those ideas aren't being shared then there is a there to me there's a great loss and so what I don't know, and I'm gonna now go and look, is exactly how those, how those line up. But in terms of the general findings, I, there was not, I would say the best way I can put it, there was nothing in here that just came out of left field to me. There was a lot of stuff that was surprising and neat and interesting, but nothing came out of left field. Um, I, I, Lauren, I don't know if you've got any further thoughts. Uh, the only thing I'd add is that that polarization is also present in like university climate studies as well, which I haven't heard of. But again, I would agree that nothing really jumped off the page of me here. That is disappointing and not surprising to hear. Um, thank you for that. Uh, just a couple things I want to uplift that I heard all of you touch on um, and surface for the rest of this conversation we have. I think there's a tension in these findings about like, these are clearly some structural problems and some big problems that require more than a committee within one discipline to think about and fix. And then there's also the reality that people are existing within the system as it is. And so how can we both push towards like structural fixes and also help folks who are working within this academic environment as it exists today? Um, and that's something I heard all of you touch on that I just want to surface that I think we're thinking about here. Um, so first, I know we have just 15 minutes for discussion. I want to touch quickly on what's unique here and what these questions raised in light of specifically the field of entrepreneurship and innovation. And maybe some folks who've been working in that field can highlight how this resonates with their own experiences. Um, so like we discussed, the survey brought forth a good bit of discussion around methodol methodological diversity and concerns about stifling in like diversity of thought. So how does that resonate with your experiences of the field? And in what particular ways have you seen that show up or not? Um, and I think I also want to bring up this theme surrounding dismissal of scholars from the South or scholars who are studying the global South. Um, and what do we think the consequence of that divide is on knowledge around entrepreneurship and innovation? I mean, in some sense, I think this comment probably this comments really reflect a bit of the polyglot nature of entrepreneurship as a study. You know, when you think about, you know, the other camp that I have my foot in, you know, which is finance, you know, there's just much more of a consensus in terms of what makes a, a, you know, a good finance paper, right? And you know, it's not that people are happy about getting their papers rejected. You know, we all feel the pain when we get the, the, um, the, the grumpy referee who tells us all the things that are wrong with our work. But at the same time, I think there's sort of more of a coherence in terms of what makes good work and you know a bit more of a common uh, common language. I think the in, in a way, one of the unique challenges of entrepreneurship is that you've got people coming from very dis different disciplinary bents. They share an interest here, but they still have you know a camp and you know a foot in the other camp and some of the attitudes there. And I think that can make for perhaps a little bit more of a uh, you know a combustible mixture, right, of people feeling disrespected or unhappy, which is really more of a, a function of just the, the nature of the field itself, perhaps. Uh, just very quickly, I think, uh, I think uh, Josh got it, you know, uh, hit the nail on the head, really. So uh, it, on one sense, I think it's, it's nice that the, the field is so, so broad, uh, in terms of you know getting different angles, basically all the social sciences are re represented, and actually um, there is work in in, in other uh, discipline that um, flows into entrepreneurship. So that's positive, and I think you we get more of the benefit uh, when we're looking at conferences. When it comes to the journal, then it becomes trickier because of course it depends on who you're. Uh, 
reviewers are uh, sort of the nitty gritty details of what methods are familiar. This I think is a, a general challenge for the entire manage for the entire field of management because I think the same uh, problem may apply to some of the other uh, discipline in uh, um, in management and I don't know that there is such a you know an easy uh, solution there so um, there is the plus that you know we there is a sort of uh, input from a variety of angles I think that the drawbacks are in uh, at the publishing stage there mm -hmm. because there is a trade-off also between making sure that there is quality and so that's a challenge yeah I think that's a great point um when I was editorial assistant in grad school for a journal, I remember if we'd get a journal submission on a really arcane topic, there's maybe five people who could qualify as reviewers for that area. And if three of them were busy, one was on FMLA, one was, you know, a conflict of interest, who can, who's going to be qualified to review that? And folks who see that topic who are outside of that domain, you know, aren't offering as helpful a feedback, you know, they're not familiar with the area. It's a really multi-pronged problem. I think that there is also one other uh, element which has been debated lately, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in general in management, which is sometimes there has been the tendency to be, to overemphasize theoretical contribution, whatever that means. I mean, if you open uh, the American Economic Review, uh, there is quite a bit of theory uh, there is more consistent your methods, but there is also, you know, you're reading about taxes, you're reading about inflation. There is a, an emphasis and an attention to practical important issues. Sometimes we don't see that uh, in, uh, in, some, uh, in some management publications, I want to say. I mean, there is a lot of great work, absolutely. Uh, but in general, I think the, the management profession is sort of uh, reflecting on uh, how much you know we are really contributing to 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 real important issue, and I think that the other emphasis sometimes on theoretical fit contributes to narrowing down and perhaps uh, reducing the ability of different things to come in because you have to fit into a particular, uh, in spite of the breadth of uh, of journals, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Rob, do you want to do you have anything to jump in? I want to give you space if you do, unless I was going to move forward to another question. And I guess, you know, one of the things that I've noticed over my career is, you know, the topics of interest kind of change over time. And it's really interesting because in the last, you know, year and a half or so, we've seen this kind of real awakening, right, to topics about race, gender, um, other issues about inequality that's been kind of reassuring, right? That there's been this kind of, you know, renewed interest in some sense. The journals have been much more open to these topics. The editors are not desk rejecting, which has always been a big problem, right? If they don't, if they don't find something interesting, they would just not even send it out to referees. And that's, um, I think, been kind of a positive improvement in the field. Um, at least that's kind of what I've noticed, you know, doing work in this area for so long that I've noticed definitely in the last year and a half, there's just been much more interest in what's going on. And, you know, that's clearly from the pandemic and um, George Floyd and, you know, this kind of increased awareness that we see more generally, but, um, you know, we'll see, let's hope it doesn't burn out, right? And it, it, hopefully it will continue. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one one question with one response each. Um, I know we've talked a bit about this, but I want to circle back to I think the part of the survey that that jumped out the most at us: these divergent opinions about diversity and inclusion um, and their value to the field. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the roots of that divergence, and I think it reflects what's going on in our society and our academy. Um, but I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit more about that and how each of us could work towards addressing that divide um, and what structural fixes we see as addressing that divide. I can start with some thoughts. Um, I, I, I don't know the fixes, but we're, we're going to try to get there. Um, my, my initial thought 
was that some of those thoughts, at, at least my perception of them, it, it's A, they're not unique um, to entrepreneurship. I think we've all kind of shared that, but that they reflect this sense and, and this feeling, I think across academia, that we're engaged in a meritocratic enterprise, right? Where the best work always wins and where your identity as a person really shouldn't matter that much. Um, and that if you have good work, if you have great work, then that's what's going to rise to the top. We're gonna to celebrate the people with great work. So certainly, yes, you know, it'll be wonderful to have more diversity because the work is always like the work is always going to be the most important thing. And I think it those kinds of comments ignore the fact that there are folks who have very different types of experiences in the academy based on their identity. So one of the data points that I really noticed is that, you know, not only are the experience of marginalization and, um, you know, feeling like you have to center yourself, not only are those more likely amongst women and people of color. The folks who are saying, I feel included, I feel, you know, like my work is important. I feel like I'm engaged intellectually, I'm engaged socially, that white folks and men were more likely to share that that's the way that they felt, that there's a certain level of privilege and feeling like I'm included, the space is for me, I'm validated in this space, that um, women and people of color don't feel. And I think it's hard to wrap your brain around that being the case if that hasn't been your personal experience. Um, I think to the extent that we can really getting folks to kind of step outside of themselves in the way that they experience the academy and that the notions that all the structures and all the systems that we've set up identify the best work all the time. It's all meritocratic. There's nothing wrong with that. There's just a few, you know, quote unquote, bad apples that we have to do what we can to kind of step away from that um, as, as our frame of reference and our frame of orientation. I think that some of that work can happen ironically through mentoring relationships, which is one of the things that, you know, was shared um, and, you know, assessed in the study. I think that when we're able to engage in mentoring relationships with folks who have identities that are different than our own, and we let them show up fully as that person, um, when we truly listen, when they share experiences that may not sound familiar to us and validate those experiences, that it starts to shift some of those perspectives that, um, we are less likely to center ourselves as like, well, this is the way that we experience this field. Um, so I think more intentionality, more structure, more training about how to engage across difference, as well as really supporting, um, there's this emerging trend on reverse mentoring relationships where, where folks are paired and the whole purpose of the relationship is for the junior first person to inform the senior person on experience and how to be um, more thoughtful and more intentional in their mentoring practice. And I think if we can invest in programs um, and support junior folks in engaging in those relationships so they're not just doing it out of the kindness of their own heart, that also could be a, a positive step towards kind of widening folks' perspectives on um, what the academy may look like for someone who does not have their identity and their privilege. I love that point. Thank you for uplifting that, Kimberly. I just kind of want to follow up on that point. You know, I've done a lot of research in different areas, you know, looking at undergraduates in chemistry at a research university, looking at community college students, even looking at students in engineering in India. And you find that whenever those students are taking an instructor or a teaching assistant that's the same race, same gender, same caste, they do better, right? That, that mentor, that communication, that kind of role model, just all of it somehow has you know some effect that we don't fully understand all the parts of it but it has an effect and it it leads to more retention it leads to per better performance it leads to students wanting to continue in the field instead of dropping out and moving to another field that might be more representative of what they're doing or you know of, of their um their race or gender or caste or religion and i think that's extremely important and that you know, that's a hard thing to change, but it's something that we really need to think about. The one thing that I would add to that, Rob, is that it, that, that almost always puts additional responsibility on the few folks that we have with marginalized and minoritized identities in those roles, which I think a lot of, and I'll speak for myself, like one of the reasons why I'm an academic is to do that kind of work. Um, but I think you know, again, if we go back to structures and systems, we have to be mindful of how we reward people for that work, that it's not just something that they do, you know, again, out of the kindness of their own heart, but they're playing a part in transforming a discipline and transforming a field and that that work 
is valuable and important and something that we reward in tenure and advancement with money and course releases and all those other things that that are valuable to us um that that we actually signal that that is important work and an important contribution and not just a nice extra thing yeah, i mean one of the interesting things is that the university of california has tried to add this to all all merit reviews of faculty so the idea was always before like research was the first thing that was looked at then teaching and then service well now we have a fourth category and that's contributions to diversity and so issues like that where if you're running you know if you're mentoring someone or you're running some kind of special program for students that's actually added as a fourth section now you know truthfully is that you know have as much weight as some of the other areas definitely not but but it's a good signal that that's something that's new that it's been added that it's talked about certainly deans are looking at it and you know higher level um, committees on academic personnel are also looking at it um, i so think that, it's critical as a first step i mean the uc is leading the way in this that it's critical as a first step to actually acknowledge it as work right like that it's not just this shadow work that folks are doing that they don't have anywhere to put down that like this is a form of work this is a real contribution um and i know um iupui has actually created um a pathway to tenure and promotion focused on you know contributions to diversity equity and justice so I think that institutions are playing with different ways of how they recognize and they celebrate this work. But, you know, again, and, and I, I don't think that there's any one way to do it, but we really have to be mindful of, you know, A, if, if we're going to ask our colleagues who have marginalized and minoritized identities who are experiencing their own forms of marginalization to do this extra work, how do we reward them for it? And B, how do we equip all of our colleagues with the competencies that they need to be able to engage in the work too? Because there are certain dimensions, there's something special shared. I totally agree when you share someone's identity, but I think that there's also work that suggests that just showing up and validating someone's identity and saying, I see you, I see you as a whole person, and you know, you can be who you are in my presence is not the same, but can really, really push that forward as well. That's an incredible note to end on. And I think you're uplifting maybe a good topic for another forum um, because unpacking the ways that we do work in the academy and what work is important and really talking about valuing that work and who's doing it. I think that's one way we can push for change in this domain. Um, I want to thank everyone here so much. Um, and I really want to thank our advisory board members who put a lot of time and effort into developing and revising this survey along with Jim and Lauren. So thank you so much and thank you for this conversation. Um, if you know anybody who wanted to make it today but couldn't, um, we will have this forum video posted on our website along with all the other recordings of our forums as well, um, typically up in a week. Uh, and a quick note before you head out, um, we'd love for you to join us in the new year at our January 28th Entrepreneurship Issue Forum. And I believe, the yes, the link is in the chat for you to go ahead and register for that now if you'd like. So thank you all so much. Have a good end of year um, and a good new year, and we'll see you then.